Yeah, Spinoza really makes the perfect segue um, for, for what I want to say. And I think that the issues of morality and where morality comes from and how we get to a moral point of view is, is really important because many scientists, famously Stephen Jay Gould, took the view that uh, morality should be handled by religion and that uh, we can, within science, talk about other things, but morality is in the province of uh, religion. And I think that's really quite wrong. Um, so what I want to do today is to say a little bit about some of the new discoveries that have been made in neuroscience, uh, behavioral neuroscience, as well as endocrinology. Some of you will have heard the story of the voles already, but it's a great story, and I'm assuming not everybody will know that story. The basic uh, position that I want to suggest is, is really very close to Spinoza, which is going to say that evolution essentially sets the style of drives and emotions and motivations that a brain has. And of course, it will differ a little bit species to species. Experience in a culture, whether it's a baboon culture, a chimpanzee, human, vole, will also then shape the style into very specific kinds of habits and preferences as a function of the institutions that exist in the culture into which you uh, happen to be born. Paul McLean, who is a neuroscientist who uh, thought a lot about emotions in the 1960s, made a very interesting observation. He said that what is new with mammals, and I'm going to put birds aside because birds are very special and they share many properties uh, with higher mammals, but what is new with mammals as opposed to reptiles is the emergence of nursing and parental care, playful behavior, the separation vocalization when the young is separated from the parent, and mate attachment. And he said this kind of, he was given to saying sort of faintly prophetic things. And he said, the history of the evolution of mammals is the history of the development of a family way of life. Now, what inspired him was the thought that in something like lactation behavior, there is a very special bond that forms. And he thought, and it turned out he's quite right about this, that it was mediated by neuromodulators. And in fact, what we know now is that uh, although oxytocin was, used to be thought to be simply involved in bodily functions such as milk letdown and uterine contractions during delivery, we now know that it also works in the brain. So when the mother suckles the child, the child actually gets oxytocin in the milk itself, but it's the cuddling and the warmth and it produces an oxytocin release both in the mother and in the infant. And what's known now also is that the oxytocin release is involved in pathways that connect to the nucleus accumbens, which is part of the reward system. So you really have the beginnings of an understanding of the nature of social attachment. But it gets a lot more interesting. It gets more interesting because a number of people, Sue Carter, Larry Young, Tom Insel, noticed something really very interesting about voles. Um, there are several species of voles. They are not interbreedable. The prairie vole uh, is a monogamous pair bonder. The two at the, after the first mating essentially pair for life. And they have a nest. They protect the nest. They reject intruders, and the other thing about them is that they are biparental. Both male and female take an extensive role in the rearing of the pups. But the montane vole is just different. It's quite a successful animal in its own niche, but the montane vole is promiscuous. So, and moreover, it turns out that the montane vole, uh, not only do they not form long-term uh, uh, mate attachments, but the females are not as, as um, long-term and intensively caring with respect to the pups. So there's maternal differences uh, as well. Now, 
when they began to try to understand what might be the difference between the two, um, a very important discovery was made. With regard to oxytocin and with regard to vasopressin. Now, both species have distributions of receptors for these simple peptides. And within a species, both sexes have a distribution. But what they discovered, and I just sort of, uh, I'll come back to that slide in a minute, is, was a, a sort of astonishingly simple result. And that is that in male prairie voles, you can predict the degree of monogamy, or you can predict how attached they will be as a function of the density of vasopressin receptors in certain very specific parts of the brain. And with females, you can predict their uh, attachment by uh, a mirror image, in, in effect. And that's the distribution of oxytocin receptors in certain very specific parts of the brain. I found this to be just an astonishing result. Because here is something that many people have thought is really a cultural concept. That is, whether you should be monogamous or whether you should be promiscuous. And it turns out that it's importantly related to your specific biochemistry. Now, they did all of the controls and the manipulations uh, that you can imagine. And that is, they blocked the vasopressin receptors in the prairie voles, and they did indeed become promiscuous, and they put uh, extra stuff into the montane voles, and, and they did become uh, monogamous pair bonders, and they did all of those sorts of, of, of controls. At the genetic level, they made a very interesting discovery. Um, of course, there is, as you would predict, a genetic difference bearing upon the expression of vasopressin receptors in the brains. But they did a, another thing that was, in a way, more interesting. Within the prairie vole population, there is a distribution of the degree of attachment to the mate. And, oh, alas, alas, not supposed to do that. And um, so they isolated the part on chromosome 17 uh, they isolated the part that produces the vasopressin um, uh, protein. And they found a region that regulates the expression that is fairly close to it, and they called it a microsatellite part of DNA. Now, what, what you see in this slide, and I do apologize for the graininess of the slide, is that amongst the prairie voles that do not form strong attachment bonds, the microsatellite region for regulating the vasopressin receptor is really quite small. And in the strong pair bonders, it's quite large. And then the question is, how does that correspond to behavior? And uh, that's what's illustrated here. So variability in receptor density is controlled by the gene, and so on and so forth. So how does this really have to do with uh, spinosa? Well, I'm getting there. But I want to make one other sort of uh, small uh, foray. There is, I think, a very common belief, it's certainly widespread amongst philosophers, that it is an axiom that you cannot derive an ought from an is. That there is this huge gap between facts and values, and that in order to have um, a decision about what you ought to do, you have to have some kind of unconditional foundation of value that tells you what unconditionally you ought to do. And I actually think that's wrong. And I think I will tell you why I think that that's wrong. The evolutionary point, of course, is that what we care about acts as the framework for what we value. So we do, of course, value food, water, sex, oxygen. But it's also the case that built into our wiring, and we can see this rather beautifully in the case of the prairie and montane voles, is that social animals also care profoundly and strongly about offspring, about mates, about parents, 
and about kin. Now, so what is all this stuff then about not deriving an ought from an is? Well, in a certain sense, everything hinges on what you mean by derive. In logic, we formally mean that a derivation is a, a valid argument. And the, the standard example is if P then Q, P therefore Q. If it rains, then the sidewalk is wet. It rains, so the sidewalk is wet. In contrast, it would be a fallacy to say if it rains, then the sidewalk is wet. The sidewalk is wet, therefore it rained. It might be the sprinkler. It might be the dogs. Who knows? But in fact, and Terry made this point rather beautifully yesterday, most of everyday life and most of science doesn't involve valid arguments and derivation at all. It involves an inference to the best hypothesis, to the best explanatory hypothesis, given the data that are available. And then if, that if new data becomes available and it conflicts with that hypothesis, we revise it. And that's what most of life is about. I see my child come in. She has a bunch of little red spots on her arm. I look at it. I know it's summer. She's been out in the bush. I infer that uh, she's got poison ivy, inference to the best explanation.